Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I am Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello, I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. So, it's really important to us here at uh, Theater Folk Global Headquarters, that we that we put plays into the world that capture the teen voice. That the teen voice is out there. And, and not only that, but we want plays that provide an expression of the teen voice, an artistic expression, a theatrical experience. That is key. That is key. That is necessary. That's what we do. That's what we are. And I just find when you have this combination in a play, that teen voice, that expression, that theatrical experience, it can be quite magical. And that's one of the reasons I love writing for teens because it's the one place. I'm sure I've shared this before. It's my, it's my favorite thing. So, you know, bear with me, but it's the one place that the, the students where a group of people can be affected by theater. These days, I fully believe they hear their voice expressed. They realize they're not alone. They can and they do. They make changes in their life because of something they see on stage. That is an amazing thing to play a very small part in. And I think this is the reason why the arts are so important in school, because the arts are a method of expression that just that doesn't happen on a daily basis in the classroom. And, oh, there's, there, there is no other group of people who has so much embo- bottled up inside of them that needs to get out, that doesn't necessarily have a proper channel to get out, if that makes sense. I, I just, uh, oh, I just think that it's so necessary. And it just leads, this leads so nicely into, um, my interview today. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to, uh, one of our playwrights, Robert Wing. He has two plays with us, Just Girls Talking and Scarlet Expectations of a Drowned Maiden and Two Greek Queens. And Robert is not a drama teacher. He did play one for a little bit when the drama teacher broke his back, but he doesn't have any drama training. And he doesn't even have any writing training. He's an English teacher who doesn't even do all that much creative writing in his class. Which is stunning when you read his work and you realize he is so good at capturing the teen voice through a theatrical experience. So how is he able to do that? Well, all right, listen and find out. So I am here with Robert Wing. Hello, Robert. Hi. And so Robert is uh, a playwright and also a teacher. He has uh, two plays with us. Uh, One is called uh, Scarlet Expectations of a Drowned Maiden and Two Greek Queens. And it is a mouthful, but it is a it's a very explanatory mouthful. I love it. Gets all the gets all the nooks and crannies of what's going on in in that play. And then also Just Girls Talking. Uh, And so but first of all, we sort of want to uh, start off with um, with. With you and who you are, uh, because your day job, you are not a drama teacher. No, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm an English teacher who, in his second year of teaching, uh, I was walking down the hallway, and the principal approached me and said, uh, you're the drama teacher. And I said, why? <laughs> and he said, because the drama teacher broke her back in a, motor, in a motorcycling accident. So I became the drama teacher for a year, and I had no experience with anything And I had zero budget. And I said, I have to put on a play. And he said, yes. And uh, I said, okay, I can do this. uh, What what resources do we have? And I I found that we had a we had a a closet filled with prom dresses from the 1980s that had been donated to the program. So I said, okay, we'll do a play that takes place at a prom in the 1980s. And there weren't any, so I wrote one, and that was it. So imagine what. How we resourceful we have to be when uh, when we have nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and I had fun with those Wait. prom dresses too. Let me tell you, it was the, the girls were pretty shocked when I got them in them because they were hideous '80s dresses. And so 
I can even play about it, and it was one of the first I got published. I, I waited about seven or eight years before I, I actually submitted one to some to a, a company. It took a long time. Why did you wait? Why did you wait so long? Uh, you know, it's odd because as a, an English teacher, um, as an English student, I don't teach a lot of creative writing. I'm very much the teacher you want to go to when you want to learn how to write a really good persuasive essay. Or, or even with reflective work, I don't do much of it. I'm a really strong technical writing teacher. And so when I wrote these plays, which I think went over pretty well, maybe the audience seemed to, to like them, and uh, people approached me with feedback saying, you know, you should try to sell that. I've seen a lot of young adult plays, and yours yours is, is good. And uh, your, your play is good. And uh, I, I didn't quite believe them because I didn't have much experience with young adults uh, plays. I hadn't seen any. And what had happened was the the what the principal finally did was he replaced me with a real drama teacher, a woman named Erin Galligan, who teaches at a school not too far from me now. She's she's brilliant. And um she re- <laughs> she replaced me and I was so grateful. And uh I had one of my scripts that I'd written because I, I was spitting these things out and she said, I think there's something quite good here. And could I direct it? May I direct it and take it to a festival? And I said, well, what's a festival? <laughs> and, and she took it to a <laughs> festival that won. And I didn't have any clue what was going on. But I went to the festival and I saw uh, what the plays were like and what the vibe was like. And I thought, oh, I get it. I, I see what's going on here. And, and I really liked it. I like writing for the kids. And, um, and so Aaron said, do you have another play? And so... I did have one that it was actually a, a classroom writing assignment I'd done where I'd taken Romeo and Juliet and broke it into six days for instructional purposes. And um, she, she, the next year she asked if she could take that one. Well, that one won again. And then, and then I thought, I think, I think I'll submit one for publication. And I started it. But that doesn't mean anything because you get rejected too, and it kind of stinks. Oh, and after the first rejection, I couldn't send another one out for two years for embarrassment. It was just too. Oh, yeah. you oh, oh. oh. They ha- it happens all the time, you know. Oh. Like it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a common occurrence. It's, it's, like, it's so funny. You're a, you're like a uh, you're you're a, you're a total sinker sinker swim kind of. It, it's been a total sinker swim kind of experience yeah. in terms of writing. You're just sort of well, I'm going to do it. I totally I totally relate relate to that. And then if if it's not around, well, it's you do it. Yeah, that's what you do. You and I, I kind of discovered that though. I when I was in high school, I never. Did, um, that I have to. Be, I'm not being entirely truthful. I did have some involvement with my high school's drama uh, uh, company. Uh, the the teacher who broke her back the year before she broke her back. I went to see one of her shows and I said, "Oh, I'd really like to do sets and costumes for you because I love to do sets and costumes. Love it. I love all the backstage stuff." But I never had a desire to be on the stage myself, although I'm a teacher, so you're kind of on one. But um, so I started doing her sets and costumes. It's still a real big love of mine. I love it. I, I've, I've done the Crucible and um, really sort of avant-garde versions of Lord of the Flies and things like that. So my my first love is kind of building the sets and the costumes. That's really fun. And so I discovered that I was kind of a theater geek in a way. I didn't know. I, I and I like the community of the actors, and it's really fun. But I also discovered that um, I'm not a director because directors have limitless patience and they speak this language <laughs> that I do not speak. When I was, uh, I had to direct one play and the rehearsal was going so poorly, I, I took my shoe off and I threw it from the back of the house onto the stage and I said, this play is rubbish! And I had to apologize to the students. <laughs> so I, I don't have that kind of patience. I think it's a different um, art form. And it's Skill set. It's just entirely different. So... I'll create plays for directors, and um, uh, and th- th- then that's fun, and being a part of the, you know, sitting through the rehearsals and, I mean, blocking. I don't know how anyone has the patience for blocking. It's the most tedious thing in the world, but directors do it, and they... Oh, I love... That's one of my... I don't get to direct very often anymore, but that actually was always my favorite part, because you're, you're creating... It's about creating okay. pictures, and can you create a picture that um, visualizes the text... So. That's it. You know, when I watched, I worked with a woman named Sherry Spurtle also, and her, her background is in directing and choreography. And every single hand extension, everything is so precise to telling the story. Once a director works with it and you get their feedback, because they will tell you what doesn't work. Well, it's it's the whole community nature of what a, a theatrical production is, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's, you, it's, I try and tell stoop playwrights all the time, it's like, 
it's it's not putting words on the page is really only the first step. It has to uh, be put into a director's hands and it has to uh, be brought to life by actors. And it's not until that step happens where everybody is involved that it actually becomes and a as play. As a writer, you have to listen. When my students say, you know, this line doesn't work, you really have to listen, especially if you're writing for people who are significantly younger than yourself. I've had actors say, you know, we wouldn't say that, Mr. Wing. So I'll go, okay. You have to sort of swallow your pride and say, well, gee, okay, all right. And uh, it's I like the process. I enjoy it very much. I kind of miss it because so I've, I've taken a bit of a year off this year. And um, I see the kids in the hallway and I'll say, oh, what are you working on? What are you working on? And they'll, you know, keep me informed, but... Uh, I'm missing it. That means you you got to write another one. If you're missing it, then it's that I means it's yeah. in you. Why do you think that you write so well for youth? Like, do you one one thing you said was that you you listen to them that you you get their language right. But where do you think do you think it's because you're in the classroom and you you hear them all the time? What do you think I it think is? It's more than just being in the classroom. I have the very very strange distinction of actually teaching in the high school that I went to for my sophomore, junior, and senior years. And I didn't enjoy high school. I never, ever, ever thought I would be a high school English teacher. I, I trained, I took a degree in English, and it was my last year of college, and my advisor said, you know, you only need a, you know, uh, to do an internship. And I said, okay, I'll do it, why not? And I, student taught at junior high school, and swore I would never go into the classroom again, because it, it was, I was about 23, it was, it was just awful. And so, uh, I became a social worker. <laughs> And then I learned a whole new definition of awful. <laughs> and I did that for about seven years. And I quit that job. The job I ever quit. And I traveled. And I was at my sink one night. And I was washing dishes. And the telephone rang. And there was a woman on the phone. And she said, I was thinking at the sink. I have one more month before my money runs out. What am I going to do? She said, is this Robert Wing? And I said, yes. And she said, are you a teacher? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> because I never paid the $200 for my license. And she said, you have a background in mental health, don't you? And I said, yes. She said, well, we've had two teachers quit in a month. Can you come in? And I said, oh, God, I don't want to, but okay, I'll try it because, you know, I need the money. Well, I walked in at the classroom at 30, and I absolutely loved it. So whatever happened in those seven years or eight years needed to happen. I walked in, and I absolutely loved it. And I absolutely have a sense of this is where I'm supposed to be. And I like these kids. I like how they talk. I like the way they interact with each other, and it's, it's strange because I'm reliving high school over and over and over from a slightly different <laughs> point, and I really like it, and I, I didn't think I would. So at age 30, I discovered my calling without having, you know, swearing I'd never go back to a classroom. But I think the seven years as a social worker really helped me gain some perspective because I know what the families are like where they come from. I live in a very, very poor area, and a uh, rough area. And I love it. It's very, very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It's Vermont. It's the northeast kingdom of Vermont. It's very beautiful. But I understand where these kids are coming from. And I listen to them. <laughs> and somehow it just translates. It just works. And um, I never patronize them, ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's a rotten thing to do. I, res I respect them. And uh, if you have no interest in the future or youth culture at all, you should not be an educator. You really shouldn't be, because you're surrounded by youth and you're swimming in it and they're Angst, which uh, it's a word that I used to despise, because I was once I once went to a festival after a few years afterwards, and I wrote a play, and they gave me a special award for best teen angst, and that really <laughs> stung. And I told my mother the next day, I said, "Oh, mother, I'm so angry. I got best teen angst. What rubbish is that?" My mom said, but "Rob, you write the best teen angst," <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, you won." And she goes. John Hughes wrote great tanks. They went, you're right. Uh, I mean, come on. So it's sort of my uh, genre. And I, I think it's, you know what though? I'll tell you, it doesn't come across like teen angst oh, at all. Mm -hmm. Like it comes, it comes across as, um, particularly in just girls talking. It's a very, it's very Good. honest Good. talk. And, uh, and I think that. But it, so was John Hughes. Well, yeah, and I think that uh, it, I think that that whole nature of um, listening and not patronizing. I mean, I've always said because that's the question I get all the time. You know, how do you how can you write for for teenagers? And and I always think, well, I just it just hasn't changed that much from when I was a teenager. Like emotionally, you know, like 
And that's what that teenage, it's a very, it's a poor word to say teen angst, but there is a very specific emotional thing that happens when you're a teenager, you know, and some people call it teen angst, but it's, it's, it's there and it, it's always been there. We've all been through it. Some people just forget. And also, I think they trivialize it. And I think, oh, no, those, those, those traumas you experienced when you were 16 change you forever. And also, people talk about high school, and they they say that you know it's not like real life. And I sometimes I say, well, you know, it's quite like real life in there. In my- oh my God, have you, have you been in an office building? All it is is it's high school with money. You know, it's, like it's a teachers' lounge. Are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just that's all we're doing is reliving high school over, over and over again. But I also I I don't know. Um, it's like Skype. This 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 what we're doing right now. I have no real interest in technology. I don't. But I find that because of the kids, I feel the need. I need to understand their language. I need to understand how they interact with the world. So I make myself do these things. You know, I, I rarely use my cell phone. I rarely text. Uh, I just don't do it. What, gets, what, what makes these kids tick? And how do they communicate? So I like my job very, very much. And what, I, what I've done with my plays is just an extension of what I do in the classroom. And well, I'll tell you what writing has done for me. It has made me a far more compassionate teacher. Whoa. How come? Because when I put my stuff out there and someone said, no, not good enough, sir, I thought of me saying to countless children, not good enough, sir. <laughs> but, I mean, of course, I couched it kindly, but it hurts. It hurts to be told that you're not good enough or you're not, you know, talk about feeling like you're 16 again. Get your first rejection letter. You're 16 again. It's to the point where I really, when I send out rejection letters, it's a very, very conscious conscious effort to not do either of those things because i know what it's like to get both because you put it out there and it, it is it, it is you know um uh kids will often ask me they'll say well which character is you and i say darling they're all me <laughs> it's it's just it's vain gloriousness it's it's this god complex in a sense of you know every one of these characters is filtered through me and when someone says not good enough it's it stings and um, the teen angst thing really, too, not to get back to that, but that really, I think people miss the point entirely because I think something like Just Girls Talking is about, everyone experiences that at every stage in their life of, of you know, and questions about, I'll tell you something else, when you write about young kids, and a number of my plays deal with this, or young adults, I should say, is the question of justice. It's very yes. hard for young yes. clients to yes. understand unfairness. And if you serve them up some platitudes like, oh, in the end, the, 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 the cheaters, cheaters never win. Well, that's not always the case. And you have to be, you have to still give them hope. It, it, it'll be all right. And, um, you just keep chugging along and hope for the best and try to, I don't know, send some kindness out to the universe. So talk about your, uh, talk about this, this writing. Now I'm dying to know because you're, because everything, that that you seem to have in terms of writing comes from an instinct, because uh, I'm assuming you you don't you didn't you haven't taken any writing I've never classes taken, or I've never taken a writing class in my life. Never okay, did. so it's all instinct. So what's it like for you to write a play? What do you do? Uh, usually, um, I I I have a colleague who who writes copious amounts. He writes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And and I say, well, do you revisit? Do you revisit? And he says, not so much. His process isn't about that. He's very very quick. Um, I might spit out 10 pages of a draft and then put it away for three months. And then I pull it out and I say, I think there's something there. And the truth be told, I I have a 27-mile commute to work and back every day through the beautiful countryside. And that's usually where I do all my thinking. uh, I have the conversations, the dialogue between my head for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks about what the characters say to each other. And then I'll put it down on paper and then I'll put it again. again. Uh, I think it's, it's it's, I love my job. And I'm very, very fortunate. It's how I make my living. So I, I think of writing as this wonderful thing that I get to do on the side. Or uh, writing is often a gift. There'll be a student that I really, really, really uh, just admire. You know, they'll, they'll work so well on that stage. And I'll go, you know what, I'm going to write a play for her. And uh, that's actually two plays last year. I had one kid in mind. She was a graduating senior. I thought, I'm going to do that for her. So I'll, I'll spend weeks and weeks and sometimes years thinking about where the play will go. And um, I know that sounds insane because 25 pages to take a year on. That's nuts, but I enjoy it. It's a very indulgent process for me. And then I'll produce a script, and then I give it to a director, and then the conversation starts. 
Now, both the uh, both the, the plays that you sent to us were uh, second submissions. Oh, you believe it. So, what happened in the time between the first and second I submission? I saw the rehearsal. <laughs> it was a nightmare. I, I, oh, why? Tell me why. I got cocky. I thought, you know, I've done this. I've done this. I'm going to send these out without seeing it staged, without running it through my director. I sat in on the first day of rehearsal in that darkened auditorium with the actors with their scripts trying to, and I just thought, oh, dear Lord in heaven, what have we got going on here? What a wreck. And um, I, I was just so shamed. And so I sat in the audience for weeks and just slashed and burned and slashed and burned. And also, characters had to evolve. All the cliches are true. You know, you, it is nothing until it's acted on the stage, until it's filtered through your actors and filtered through the director. It's nothing. Uh, because um, it might be the most vivid thing in your imagination, but <laughs> oh, good lord, it was awful. Two stinkers, two real stinkers, and um, you know it's all vanity. I just thought I've done this, I've done this, and uh, no, I hadn't done it. I hadn't done the work, and um, it showed. And then I felt very, very embarrassed, very embarrassed. And then I felt a little ashamed because I thought, oh, I'm wasting the actor and the director's time. So you kind of have to eat humble pie and listen, and um, I did it. And then, and then it started to become a play again, which is a lovely process. I love the last, because at my school, Sherry and I usually do a very, very long rehearsal period. We'll do three months for a one-act play. How wonderful oh, is that? One, are you kidding? You have a troop of actors who are yours. I have three months between that, that first script. They, the first script the actors see is typically about a fourth or fifth draft for me, typical. And so then there might be eight drafts by the time it's done. And so it's been filtered again and again and again. And scenes have been run and run and run and moved around. I cannot, I cannot stress how important work with the director is. You, it is so important. It is important. And, and I love the process. I'll accept the blocking. <laughs> yeah, but that's the directors. That's, that's, that's their, their job. job. You can just sort of sit back and, uh, and see the, the yeah. outcome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Although it's great because um, I know when it's good because the last two or three weeks before the show goes up, it's new again. And I'll look at Sherry and she'll look at me and we'll just kind of nod and go, oh, we've got a show here. We've got a show. And that's a great feeling. And, um, and I love it because I write dialogue very, very fast. And lines are supposed to ping, 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 ping. And when actors find that rhythm, it's so satisfying. I love it when they, they, they hit their stride and the lines are just flying. And uh, because I don't have a lot of experience prior to becoming a teacher working with the theater, I know that there's a, a time for everything and things evolve. But I, I was an outsider coming in and thinking, how does this happen? When does that magic happen? And those last couple of weeks, I, I love that part when it's when it's finally a play and it's it's beautiful. Well, not the process is beautiful. No, it is beautiful. It it sort of. Uh it take well. It, co- it takes on a life, and then and then you bring the you audience hope in. It takes a lot. And that's another experience because when um we perform for an audience, I'm watching the audience. I'm I'm really trying to see which lines elicit which response because I've written lines before that were quite serious that elicit giggling. I thought, oh dear, <laughs> I have to go back and cut those. And there's certain jokes and. Um, certain pauses that you, you create and you, you make sure they're in the script and you hope they work, you hope they work. And and I watched them. There was actually a window in our auditorium, kind of an angle to the stage, and I can hide behind it and watch people because I'll sit with a script and go, oh, that's not so good. I once went to a, a presentation, David Sedaris, the humorist, the writer, I don't know, well, it was brilliant, and he came to Burlington. I just saw him uh, two weeks ago. But did you notice when he was reading, he had a little pencil, he'd make little marks. Yes, she makes notes. She makes, makes notes work. as he goes. I, it was that was my favorite part. The, the question session. Someone said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm marking it when people laugh." Well, that, that's so yeah. simple. If you're writing a comedy, you have to know when people are going to laugh. So that's what I do. I. Uh, and uh, well, and when I uh, when I saw him, it was the it was the very beginning. So like it was like stories that had just been oh, he had just told a couple of times. Yeah. So it was like it was as a writer, it was very. It was a very, because we were right up close, so it was a totally satisfying thing to watch that I happen. love to watch his, other people's process, because I think, because when you create, you, you, it's such a solitary thing. You, you, 
watch someone else do it and, and you realize they have the same insecurities that I have. Oh, gee, that line won't work or that transition doesn't work or I'm losing people here. And it's very satisfying. I've discovered that quite late in life, the, the process of um, or the act of even talking about writing because it's something I never did. I'm a very good technical writer. And so the whole creative side of it, the um, just fiction, I, it wasn't my thing. And, and I didn't know I had a voice for it, but I guess I kind of do. And it's, it's really fun. Awesome. Okay. So as we, as we wrap up here, as a, as a, as an outsider, what does, what does theater mean to you? Sort of, have you sort of dipped into this world? As coming at it as an outsider, what does theater mean to you? It's incredibly warm. I, I, it's hard to describe. It's like this island of misfit toys all get together after school and they try to make something meaningful and they try to make something beautiful and it's charming and it's, um, it's very much what every teacher wants to do in his or her own classroom, but it rarely happens. But there are these like-minded people who sort of gravitate towards an auditorium who do it. And, and I love it. I love writing things for kids. I love, love, love. I, for example, I just saw a version of, um, uh, Sherry did a version of um, Little Shop of Horrors. And her main actress is a lovely young lady named Shannon. I'm thinking, oh, she's a senior next year. i got to write a piece for her. i just got to because she's just so full of life and fun and kindness. I just want to give her something. And I don't know. I, that's what a lovely, what a lovely gift that you can give your students. Like here's a play just I, for you. That's awesome. Names that I actually usually characters. Yeah. After, I say that was inspired by you. And sometimes kids will say, I said that once I, you wrote that down. I said that. And I went, well, maybe I did. <laughs> so, you know, I'm always lifting things that kids say. Ah. Uh. Very nice. Lovely. Uh, Robert, this has been uh, an awesome uh, time. Thank you for uh, sitting down and uh, having a chat with me today. Very kind of you. And awesome. And uh, and so and yes, uh, everybody, we need to check out. I'm going to read the title correctly. Scarlet Expectations of a Drowned Maiden and Two Greek Queens and Just Girls Talking. Um, Okay, Robert, have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Robert. I really, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed this conversation. Okay, so before we go, let's do some theater folk news. All right, I'm talking to you. We've mentioned this a couple of times on our on our Facebook, and uh, we did another podcast on this, but are you working on your world theater video project? I know, I know, you've only been back in school a couple of days, but the deadline's coming up. It's January 25th. It's very simple. You know, you take a monologue, which the monologue's already chosen for you. It's on the website, worldtheatervideo.com. And it just happens this, uh, in the December, January slot to be one of my monologues. So I'm so happy. I can't wait to see, uh, what, uh, what classes and groups do with it. So all you have to do is you take that, take the text, find a way to visualize it. You know, perhaps with Tableau, maybe with um, group speaking, uh, individual speaking, maybe uh, you use pictures, you know, come up with something, film it. You don't even need to get fancy. Pull out that phone if you have to, send it in. Go to worldtheaterevideo.com for more information. If you practice uh, project-based learning in the classroom, if you need to find a way to incorporate more technology in the classroom, what an excellent place to start. What an excellent project. I'm so happy to be and thrilled to be, uh, to play a part in it. And finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk. You can find us on the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. Go over there. Search on the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care.